Well, welcome. Thanks for coming out on this gloomy uh, Monday morning. We hope we have a, a story of good cheer for you today. It's a, a fascinating tale of a mixture of aviation and engineering and intelligence all working together to solve a national security problem in a very characteristically American fashion. Money, brains, technology. That's always the answer to everything. Well, not always, but in this case, it certainly proved to be so. As we have an aircraft that to this day, it, among it and its variants, is unsurpassed in speed and altitude, Mach 3.2 plus at 90,000 feet. Uh, and along the way, there were, of course, many, many engineering and technological challenges to confront. And we have on our panel here some uh, technical experts, uh, designers, scientists, engineers who worked with those issues and overcame them. And you'll also hear from a couple of the pilots who flew both the A-12 and the SR-71. So we'll get the, the front end of the story about how it was designed and put together, and then we'll have an intelligence part of it where we hear about how it was used. One of our uh, FORTO interpreters will discuss uh, his craft and explain the sort of so what behind it. After all, it is an intelligence collection platform. That's an essential part of the story as well. And then the legacy of it as we move on to the SR-71, the much more long-lived aspect of the program. The strategic issue involved here is what do we do about finding out the most crucial national security issue of the day, the Soviet strategic threat, which came into fruition a bit earlier than we had expected, courtesy of all of the spies they had in the Manhattan Project and elsewhere, advancing their atomic program by estimates vary two, three years, maybe four at the outside. By 53, they had the H-bomb, and we're very, very concerned about what they're going to do with this weapon, where the sites are, how their development program is going. The problem from a collection standpoint, from an intelligence standpoint, is that we simply did not have eyes on the target behind the Iron Curtain. We did not have a set of assets working in those programs. We were largely dependent on defectors because of the Soviet police state. We did not have the primo spies like Popov and Penkovsky until later into the decade or even the early 60s. So we are, in a sense, blind about what's going on there. We don't have the signals collection either, even to pick up that aspect of it. So having been unable to satisfy the intelligence need through the peripheral flights, through the SENSINT program, we need something that can actually get over target, hence the U-2 program. The problem with the U-2 program is that it was tracked from its very first mission. And this also was courtesy of the Soviet espionage apparatus uh, back uh, in the 1940s, and also their transformation of some of the Lend-Lease radar we had given them during World War II into more powerful uh, painters of high-altitude aircraft. So what are we going to do if the only platform we have at the time, the U-2, is increasingly vulnerable. The satellite program isn't up and running yet. That doesn't have its first successful mission until 1960. What are we going to do to fill the gap? A discussion ensues. Do we want to simply create a slightly better aerial platform, one that's marginally faster, can fly slightly higher, maybe has some countermeasures in it or some stealth capabilities? Kelly Johnson, whom you'll hear about uh, directly from one of the individuals who worked with him at the Skunk Works, said, no, let's move a whole generation ahead. Create an aircraft that will outlive the threat for many, many years, something that could fly so high and so fast that it was, for all practical purposes, invulnerable. And that's the origins of what initially was Project Gusto, which was the period of time when there was the competition between various uh, aviation corporations to produce a prototype design, and then ultimately the Oxcart program, which begins in 1959. The code name, by the way, Oxcart, is a deliberately ironic one. When the sheet of randomly generated code names came down to the chief engineer from the agency on the program, John Perengoski, uh, he went down, up and down it looking at things probably, I've never seen the sheet, but it probably contained names like Ocelot and Omelette and Oakwood. And then he sees Oxcart. And he says, isn't this kind of a neat little trick to play? We're going to name the fastest moving thing that we've ever built after one of the slowest things on Earth and it stuck. 
Oxcart over the years, as you probably know, came to be attached to the aircraft itself, the A-12, but more properly it deals with the entire R&D program to develop this uh, supersonic aircraft. It was a long struggle. Unlike the U-2, which came in on time and under budget, the A-12 was a much more difficult technical challenge, and we'll be talking about some of those aspects of it this morning. You can see the milestones here. It was slow and steady pace, gradually increasing in tempo as technical challenges were overcome. And I do think remarkably, even though it is a stretched out production uh, timeline here, when you think about going from paper to Mach 3 plus flight at 90,000 feet in just a little over six years, that's pretty impressive, especially since almost all of it was designed with one of these. The only computer capabilities that I'm aware of were used for, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Dennis, uh, was on some of the fuel calculations. I think that's where the, the computers were, were cranked up a little bit for that. But the rest of it was, uh, was pretty much all done with the, uh, the slipstick. Pretty astounding when you think about it. And it's a, a credit to the ingenuity and the brains and the persistence and the creativity of people at Lockheed and the subcontractors such as Pratt and Whitney, EG and G, uh, and others who all work together very seamlessly to create a, an outstanding uh, superlative aircraft. And we'll be talking about this a little bit later, the essential support role that the Air Force played in providing refueling capabilities and support uh, personnel, uh, both at the Nevada test site, which for this audience is all we're allowed to say about where it was. You can attach whatever other names you wish to it that are bandied about in public, but that's officially all we can say is the Nevada test site. Operationally, what is it used for? It is a collection platform, photographic initially, though it was capable of carrying other sensors one at a time. And Rich Graham, one of the former pilots from the SR program, will highlight the differences between the two aircraft, which are uh, important to understand. A lot of people confuse them. Uh, we had an embarrassing incident not too long ago in my own organization in which a to be left unnamed senior executive of the agency referred to our SR-71 that was sitting out there in the, uh, in the parking lot up on the pylon. We, uh, we quickly uh, indoctrinated her into the program uh, and uh, that person has not made the same mistake since, at least that I've heard about. Here are the operational milestones then. We have the program six years from drawing board to operational deployment almost a little bit of floundering around in the interim until things are, are ready to go. We'll talk about in a little while why the mission was flown over East Asia rather than the intended target, the Soviet Union. And here's pretty much how it went uh, in a nutshell. First mission over North Vietnam, and we'll have some details about that also to share with you. And then a very important uh, use of the aircraft showing its flexibility and why some people would argue even today, despite the satellites and the UAVs, wouldn't it be nice if we still had this kind of quick reaction capability, being able to scramble an aircraft right into the middle of a hot spot that suddenly uh, blew up all of a sudden and creating, uh, collecting vital intelligence to help break a diplomatic impasse. And you'll hear some of that from uh, Arthur Beidler, who was a photo interpreter at, on that aspect of the program. And so you see the, the major aspects of it. Astoundingly, the A-12 program it itself is very short-lived operationally barely 12 months, late May to early May of the following year. Why did that happen? You'll hear a little bit about that. It's a kind of a inside the beltway story about competing equities and budgets and bean counters and, and people of that sort. A very, very familiar tale, uh, I'm sure, to all of you. The SR-71, which took a little bit longer to become operationally ready, moves onto the scene. Uh, there's a dispute between various agencies about which aircraft is appropriate for the, for the target set. Uh, the SR-71 takes over the mission and the A-12 is retired uh, back to California where it sits in mothballs figuratively uh, in Palmdale, California for a number of years. Gradually they were opened up and dispersed to museums when the program started to be declassified piecemeal uh, over the years. The SR-71 has a much longer life from 1968 to 1989, flying over 3,500 missions. And it too, because largely of cost concerns, is retired in 1989. During uh, the various diplomatic and military uh, conflicts of the mid-1990s, uh, Congress decides that 
it should be resurrected. It is reactivated for a short period of time. Three of the aircraft are prepped for use, but that too falls away after a presidential veto. Let's start talking first about the essence of the aircraft, the fundamental requirements that it had to meet. If it was to surpass the U-2 in capabilities, it had to fly higher and faster. And as I said, Kelly Johnson's vision was one that was exponentially almost higher and faster. Uh, supersonic speeds, ones never reached uh, before uh, anywhere close. The fastest flying aircraft at the time, I think, was running about 1,400 miles an hour or so. Uh, high altitude flights, you wanted to get it uh, above the capabilities, certainly of any fighter airs, but also of surface-to-air missiles. And ideally, too, you wanted it with a small radar cross-section. So knowing that it would be tracked, it would be very hard to figure out what exactly it was, and by the time you figured that out, it was well past uh, the threat area. These are the fundamental challenges. And along the way, as you're trying to implement these in uh, a physical addition of it, lifting it off the drawing board and making a, a, a product, making an aircraft, you had some very significant difficulties arising. One of them had to do with the fact that when you're flying that fast, your aircraft heats up. Uh, average skin temperature around the outside is about 600 degrees. Various spots are, are even higher. You have to have a particular metal that can withstand that, but it has to be light enough so that you can fly it that fast and at that height. So titanium is fashioned upon, but it's very tough metal to work with. And you'll hear some of that from, uh, from Bob Murphy, uh, who worked at the Skunk Works. You also had to have a special fuel. Because of the heat, conventional aviation fuels wouldn't work. They would just blow up. So a special fuel is designed. And Dennis Nordquist from Pratt & Whitney will talk about some of the peculiarities of the JP-7 fuel. And all along the way, because of these stresses, mainly because of the heat problem, you had to have brand new things fashioned all the time, everything from wiring to lubricants and so forth. The whole cottage industry grew up around this aircraft. The pilots uh, endured uh, significant discomfort. They had to wear pressure suits. They were sitting almost inside an oven. Indeed, they were, the suits were tested by putting people inside ovens to see when they would say, hey, it's getting hot in here. And in order to cut down on the uh, heat that the aircraft was, uh, was building up, the fuel itself became a coolant as it uh, circulated around, uh, around the engines. The cross-section question was, uh, was a naughty one. Uh, Jean Poteet will talk to you a little bit uh, about that, how they tried to design the aircraft for radar suppression. That's one reason why it has that distinctive chine shape, so the radar waves just kind of disperse. Uh, use of composite, special paint, other types of design and materials to uh, keep the, the radar cross-section down. One of the bizarre aspects of the aircraft, and you wouldn't have known this until you got up there and cranked it up to about 2.5 or 6, is that the engines had a, an unfortunate tendency to snuff out, at least one of them anyway. And uh, you'll hear from Ken Collins about what a thrill that was to suddenly be flying that fast and have uh, one of your engines go out. How did you fix that? particular design changes uh, to the engine, uh, particularly those inlet spikes. They move in and out about 26 inches to regulate the airflow. There were other things done uh, inside the engine with some uh, complicated fixes on how it was designed. Dennis uh, will tell us about some of those. And then one of the quirks about the aircraft, the leaking fuel tanks. The special fuel, JP-7, uh, did not get along very well with uh, engine tank sealants. And uh, it's been reported that the first A-12, when it was taken out to the test site from the Burbank fabrication facility, and when it was filled up with fuel, it leaked like a sieve. Uh, it's interesting, in, in Kelly Johnson's papers, he talks about an acceptable drip rate. Depending on where you are around the aircraft, you could have 5 to 60 drips per minute. Now, if I was a pilot, I might be a little daunted at this. I'm not sure I'd want to go out in uh, my driveway each morning and count the drips coming out of the uh, engine casing. But this was something you had to live with. Uh, eventually it was uh, modified and, and got better over time, but it was one of those odd situations in which you had to depend on something else to fix the problem, which is the fact that the aircraft grew about three or four inches uh, in dimensions when it got so hot, and that sealed the gaps for the most part. 
Here's the man behind it all, Kelly Johnson, probably the most brilliant aeronautical engineer the United States, if not indeed the world, has ever seen. Uh, a special man uh, in, in all regards, in personality, in leadership style, in vision, in organizational capability, in sales uh, ability. I mean, this man had it all. He had the, the brains to put it together, he had the smarts to run it right, and he had the intuition to sell it. And you put those all three into one person and you have a unique individual. And Bob Murphy, who worked out at the Skunk Works during this period of time, is one of the chief engineers on the aircraft, uh, will talk to us about what was it like to work with Kelly? What was it about Kelly that made the Skunk Works such a special place? And why really, when you think about it at the time, it was the only place that this kind of aircraft could have been put together? Bob, please. Kelly had tried to sell a jet aircraft to the Air Force in early 1941. They didn't know anything about jet aircraft, so they weren't interested. However, when the Me-262 started shooting down B-17s, they got interested very fast. They called Kelly back to right field. He made some sketches. He took the crew and said, uh, gee, they look pretty good, Kelly. I'll get you in. Kelly said, well, I'm flying back today, and uh, I'll wait for your answer. He said, no, you're not. He said at 1 o'clock this afternoon you'll have a contract and there's an airplane waiting to drive back to Burbank and you said you could do it in 183 days. Well, uh, and then he said this is day one. So Kelly flew back to Burbank where we were at that time producing 27 airplanes a day of various types. So he pulled together a bunch of engine crates made a manufacturing area. An old glue factory was uh, up against these crates and uh, that's where engineering was. But uh, it was really essentially one building. Uh, he pulled them, uh, we did it in 143 days. We had about 22 engineers and uh, as was the process at Lockheed, uh, we built the prototype and then he turned the production over to the manufacturing organization after the flight, original flight test was finished. He went from there taking the same engineers with him, or a majority of them, and uh, did the uh, T-33, then the F-90, then the uh, F-94, then the 104, YC-130, and then the U-2. Now the U-2 was the first airplane where we did the total production. And uh, that worked splendid. Uh, contract in January, first flight in August, flight test milestones all met before the first of the year, deployed the sheep dip pilots uh, in April and started flying missions over Russia. Now as soon as that happened and he realized that they were able to track them, he started a vulnerability study, and from that, he uh, opened a stealth lab and, uh, and a series of uh, drawings, which a number of copies are around. He decided to be able to survive. He'd have to fly above 80,000 feet and uh, above Mach 3. So working with Mr. Bissell, who was the uh, head of the CIA on the U-2 operation. We proceeded. There was only one minor problem. Everything on the damn airplane had to be invented. Everything. Fuel, oil, hydraulics, wiring, metal. He made a decision right away to use titanium. Unfortunately, the first batches we got uh, were so full of carbon that if you heated them and dropped them, they broke. So they were all scrapped. So he said an engineer there. Now the secret of the skunk works was everybody was in the same building, the engineers, the manufacturing, the purchasing department. There were no staff people, no blueprint checkers, no uh, planners, manufacturing planners, no uh, I got to be involved in this because I run this part of the thing. So the engineer drew the drawing and uh, less than the distance from here to the top of the auditorium was the shop floor. And he walked out to the manager responsible, say, for building the 
Florida fuselage and gave him the blueprint. Went over it with him. The manufacturing manager uh, decided which parts he could make himself, which ones he couldn't, wrote orders to the machine shops or to the hot sizing sheds uh, uh, to make the parts for him. And if there was an engineering problem come up, he would call the engineer who would come out on the floor, mark the drawing with a lead, with a red pencil, and uh, he was allowed to make five changes that way before he re-released the drawing. Uh, this went along uh, splendidly and uh, in nothing flat uh, we found out that uh, forming this titanium that we used, uh, the two alloys, A110 and B120, were uh, a little tougher. You could drill three or four holes with the drill and that was the end of the drill. Uh, finally, they got one from Germany that would uh, uh, drill 150 holes. We made some tests. We had an old World War II fighter dug out there alongside the Burbank <laughs> runway. If they knew what we were doing in there, they'd have put us all in jail. We had a full-size uh, mock-up, or not a mock-up, a tank made out of steel of the what would be the fuselage with the fuel tanks in it and it had a six degree ro motion. And uh, we made a test section of the wing with uh, just like you do a regular airplane that was skinned flat. When we heated it to uh, 800 degrees, it disintegrated. It just pulled itself together. And that's why it's corrugated. If you look at it today, that simple deal takes the stress out of it. Uh, we had we had an oven for a cockpit section, and uh, we found a lot of problems in that too. But the key to it was the problems, Kelly came up with a corrugated deal in about three days. And every problem we ran into, that's the way it was handled. Now one of our biggest problems was forming uh, titanium parts that had uh, shapes or jog, joggles in them and so forth. We, and we destroyed a ton of blocks trying to develop material that would do it. Uh, we preheated the blocks to 1200 degrees, uh, put the part to be compressed in there and de depending on the thickness of the metal, a very long dwell time at uh, extremely high temperatures because titanium has a very uh, great memory to wanting to go back where it was before you pushed it. The other deal was we found out that uh, how many things contaminated titanium. One of them was cadmium, and everybody's tools were coated with cadmium. So we had to take all the mechanics' tools and strip the cadmium off their wrenches and so forth. And then we found out the Burbank water supply had too much chlorine in it, which after we spout welded the panels and washed it with their water, uh, if you heated it, it'd crack. So we had to uh, put in our own filtering system to keep that and numerous other things. Uh, developing uh, the cutting of fluid for the machine shops was invented. Uh, we had an engineer uh, assigned directly with the machinist and they invented the cutting oil to be able to cut titanium, which doesn't cut easy. Now, part of the secret of this deal, all the way along through all these programs, Kelly had brought along these basic engineers. So he had about 15 or 16, and it started with them in 1943. All the shop managers except myself had been on the PA in 1943. As I was 13 at that time, I was not one of them. Uh, and each one, the, the total was eight managers. And then under them would be a number of uh, first level supervisors. But they, uh, working directly with engineering, we made progress every day. No problems laid in the cushion. There was no committee meetings. Uh, I'll call Washington and see what they can do. 
but if we needed some help, like to get some machine tools that were government owned, uh, it just took a phone call to Washington and that, that happened right away. Uh, the uh, situation of the way the Skunk Works operated with no intermediaries between it and no help from Washington. That's the first rule of the Skunk Works. The manager has to be allowed complete control of his program, almost unlimited. Keep the, go the government informed with the cost on a 90-day basis and uh, press on. We use no computers. Uh, as uh, Kelly Johnson called his slide rule, a Michigan computer. And uh, when you went in his office and asked him a question, he whipped out his computer. The, everybody walked around. It was walk around management. Kelly was out on the shop floor. He was walking around the design boards. And the design boards, here's one, here's one. This is an engineer, this is an engineer. They're talking together all the time. None of this, the electrical guys are here and the plumbing guys are here. The hydraulic fluid <clears throat> turned out to be a very difficult problem to get something that would withstand those pressures and still lubricate. And Kelly got a number of samples, one of them in the mail. It was in a bag and it was a solid. But he said when it gets to 800 degrees, it will be a liquid. Well, that obviously was going to work. So. Uh, somebody invented what we needed, and Kelly had they added some of our own uh, ingredients. To give you an example, if you go in, in a shop here or on a flight line or whatever, and they're doing a leak check, they hook up a hydraulic gig and pump the hydraulic pin at the pressure they want and check it out for leaks. Well, we had to preheat the oil to 500 degrees before we put it in the airplane. Uh, if you wanted to look for legitimate leaks because they would appear when the airplane was hot and everything was moving. The airplane was growing a little wider and a little longer and, and so forth. And that worked out, worked out pretty good. The airplane had four hydraulic systems, so uh, separate. Uh, redundant control, uh, cables all the way back to a mixer and then hydraulics. Uh, I, I can think of a million problems we ran into uh, to make sure that the titanium was all right. Every sheet that came in from the Titanium Corporation of America, and by the way, this titanium sponge came from Russia, uh, we uh, cut coupons. And then we'd test the coupons by bending them and so forth. And then those coupons traveled with the parts till they were finished to make sure no bad titanium was in the system. Uh, in fact, Kelly said, I thought at one time all we did was make test pieces. <laughs> but as it turned out, over the next 10 years, we made 30 million titanium parts in this little old shop. Uh, we're very successful. Uh, one of the advantages, uh, when I said he brought along the engineers, we ought to brought along the shop mechanics, same ones that had been there in 1943 were still there, most of them. And so it was a, a place to rally around the new people, and uh, things went pretty good after that. I guess you guys know how hot it gets in that airplane. The AP-8 doors are 2,400 degrees. That's the last ones on the airplane. One of the examples I'd like to give you of the, uh, what the people did on their own, if you look at the airplane, you'll see these louvered doors, louvers, they're about one foot square, and there's all these little veins. And those veins had to be welded in there. Well, you can't weld titanium in an oxygen atmosphere. So uh, I asked my uh, supervisor of the welders how we were going to do this. And he says, don't worry, Murphy. He says, I've already ordered a big plastic dome. And uh, I come down the next day, and there it was mounted on a table 
with clamps holding it down, two welder's gloves built into it, the acetylene torch inside, and a whole bunch of little flashlight bulbs with no glass on them. And each one of those bulbs had a switch. So they fed argon gas in here and took the oxygen out, and every time he thought he was ready to weld, he'd turn on that light. If the light burned out, there was oxygen in there. If it kept burning, it means he had completely bled the system, and they'd start to weld these louvers. Now that's just, you know, that that's the shop people doing this, not having some big operation, invent some fancy, just imagine what you do with, in a regular world, you'd have the whole thing inside a tank, I guess. But that was very typical of the, of the way it worked. And uh, I don't remember uh, losing any hair uh, at that moment. <laughs> but the uh, building all the U2s and the people involved, and of course it was a contractor operation, uh, just had this spirit in there. The, the, it was a team, like Band of Brothers, the whole damn outfit. And uh, uh, when I give you a personal experience, which could have cost me my job, I'm sure, in uh, February, you know, in uh, November of uh, 1961, Kelly was having a little meeting. He was sitting at the end of the table. In fact, I've seen some videos of this. And he had the model of the airplane, and he had the eight managers and the director of operations. And he asked each manager what they thought about this roll date in February. And the poor guys that were doing the fuselage and the inlets were ha having a lot of trouble, but they said, mm, yeah, well, um, yeah, you know, we got a little problem, but I think we can make it. And that's the way he went around the table. So he gets around to me, and uh, having run the uh, U-2 operation in Turkey and so forth, we couldn't take no for an answer, so he said, what do you think of that date, Murph? And I said, no sweat on that date, Kelly. Well, a month later, my boss showed me where he wrote on a piece of paper. He says, fire army obviously doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> <laughs> but Kelly, not being uh, exactly uh, dumb, said, uh, when are you going to have power on? And going, 26th of December at 9 o'clock. Pulled it right out of there. <laughs> this was where the chance to get fired. So the balcony overlooked where the airplane was below it, and engineering was right there. And I knew at 9 o'clock, sure enough, here he comes out of engineering, up the stairs, looks in. The instrument panel was lit. Now that happened because my electrical engineer, or my electrical manager, had said, you know, Murph, we haven't got the back end. They haven't got the structure finished yet, so that isn't wired. I says, I'm talking from station 715 forwards, okay, isn't it? He says, yes. I says, fine. That'll light the cockpit, won't it? He says, yes. Well, we rolled on that day because once somebody has said we can make it, the other guys have got to make it or they will look bad. So we rolled on the date. Thanks, Bob. I think that really gives you a great personal insight into the unique atmosphere at Skunk Works. And uh, somewhere along the line, it kind of got lost. Um, not sure where we can find it back again. I'm sure it exists in little pockets here and there. But uh, it's a, it was a different world and really is very largely responsible for the, uh, the quick success, relatively quick success that we had in making a really astounding uh, aircraft. can hardly say enough about it. And it remains, along with its, its variants, the, the highest flying uh, fastest piloted jet aircraft uh, ever made. One aspect of the program that hasn't gotten a lot of attention is the, the element of stealth. The A-12 was the first stealth aircraft uh, designed deliberately to be that. There were some experiments with stealth technology with the U-2, but they simply didn't work. They ruined its uh, airworthiness. So the A-12 is designed in part to be not just fast and high flying, but also relatively invisible to uh, hostile radar. 
And Jean Poteet, who is an electronics engineer and physicist and uh, missile guidance engineer for many years, uh, has some interesting insights into how the origins of stealth technology uh, developed during the construction and design of the uh, A-12 aircraft. Jean? Thank you. The, the concept of stealth is as old as radar itself. Engineers have dreamed from the beginning of radar, you know, how can you, de how can you defeat it? It's always the same story. The, uh, as a matter of fact, the, uh, it, toward the end of World War II, the German engineers were very advanced and they were thinking the same thing about how could we build an aircraft that is stealthy. And I believe you see pictures here of the Hitler's stealth bomber. The airplane never was finished and flew. What you see here in these slides is are the, uh, the parts of the aircraft were captured by the Americans toward the end of World War II, along with all the detailed plans for building uh, a jet bomber that was stealthy that could make it all the way to New York and bomb New York. The hope sprang eternal in the Germans to the bitter end. Nonetheless, uh, the plane never did see a flight. They, but they, they attempted to, it, it was painted with a radar absorbing paint. They also used a high carbon material embedded in, in wood glue to serve as the ram radar absorbing material. But it was a good effort. You can see the similarities of this very, very beautiful airplane that never did make it. We were very lucky that it did not. The uh, theory of stealth is very simple. It turns out you want, it has to do with the shape of the airplane. You want to shape it such that the reflections from a radar are deflected away in some other direction than back toward the radar receiver. And if you notice on the, uh, the uh, uh, A-12 box card and the SR-71, those, those rudders were tilted inboard rather than outboard for that very reason. It was to, uh, it was, it was, and it was consisting of ra radar absorbing material or RAM along with the shape. Now, the, uh, what happened was after the U-2 was shot down in uh, May 1960, this airplane, uh, the uh, A-12 Oxcart, was already under development. But Eisenhower had been so traumatized over the shoot down and the, the consequences of losing the U-2, he came to the CIA, who's been given the responsibility to build this airplane along with the Corona satellite and the U-2. And he said that plane, the A-12 Oxcart, will not fly over the Soviet Union until you can prove to me that it is in fact invisible to Soviet radar. And uh, right away, uh, my two bosses, uh, Bissell and John Perangoski, turned to me and said, Gene, uh, you've got a new job. Good luck. Yeah. Uh, I took the afternoon off. Uh, I, went, <laughs> I thought I better go somewhere and hide. But nonetheless, uh, I had a cold beer on my back porch, uh, <laughs> stimulating, I suppose. But nonetheless, the CIA had access to the world's leading scientists. It, we could draw upon the world's leading scientists to, for advice and help. But eventually, we came up with a plan to absolutely uh, test the stealth concept against Russian radars. The, uh, the first thing we did was we needed to know how powerful the Soviet radars were. We needed to know their power, the shapes of their patterns, their complete coverage, the details of their receivers, how sensitive the receivers were, and how qualified and how good were the Russian radar operators. And there was one particular new long-range radar that caused us great concern as the VHF radar called the Tall King. But we equipped a fleet of airplanes with the help of the Air Force. We had a fleet of about three aircraft that were flying laboratories that could measure the, uh, 
powering patterns of these radars and the detailed signal structure that was in each of their radar pulses. We mounted operations uh, with these aircraft. They flew around the periphery of the Soviet Union. We outfitted uh, other aircraft that routinely flew in the Berlin corridors that, that could get closer to the, the missile, uh, SA-2 missile radars and so on. And uh, that project was called Combat Scent. It may not be a surprise to you to know that that project continues to this day more than a half a century later under the control and management of the Air Force and uh, NSA. And that's because these projects continue to support uh, all military operations, electronic countermeasures, and so on. But one of the more interesting projects, we needed to know how good the radar, their radar receivers were, how sensitive and how good were their operators. We came up with another technique to do that we basically built an electronic device that could transmit signals into the Russian radars and simulate an aircraft flying into the Soviet radars. The project was called Palladium. Now, since we knew the power and patterns of all the radars and the signal structure, we could transmit a signal that appeared to be uh, an aircraft target being tracked by that particular radar. Uh, and we could fly that false electronic aircraft at any altitude and speed. And I, we mounted operations uh, uh, around the world in different ways to, to do this. Uh, it's kind of interesting. We ran operations from islands not too far that were near Soviet long-range radars. We uh, ran operations from uh, ships at sea and some operations from submarines with just our antenna sticking above the water. The uh, interesting thing about that was we were so pleased. And by the way, we ran these operations in the Arctic, we in the northern parts of Japan and the islands and so on. But when the Cuban Missile Crisis came along, the Russians moved their latest military hardware to Cuba, all their latest radars and everything. So we were very pleased. It was much more fun to operate out of uh, Key West in the Caribbean, I can tell you, than the Barents Sea in the Arctic. And we were one happy bunch of guys. And our basic base of operations was, was uh, uh, Sloppy Joe's in uh, Key West, Florida. <laughs> Nonetheless, uh, we were running these operations that would simulate a plane flying out of uh, Boca Chica Naval Air Station, going to overfly Havana, and the radars were tracking it. And we had an amazing thing. We had an intelligence team from the entire intelligence community that, with us, that could listen in and, and uh, the re get the reaction of the radar operators. They would talk among themselves and so on. And we had a Russian linguist, we had uh, Spanish speakers, uh, we had a naval security group that provided the intelligence. We had one translator from DIA, by the way. If he, I don't know if he's here. He, he'd be as old as I am if he were. <laughs> uh, nonetheless, uh, it turned out we, we maybe got too good at the job. It turned out it was very realistic. The Cubans and the Russians began to launch fighter aircraft to intercept our aircraft that was not there. <laughs> and on one particular night, uh, we, the Russians and the Cuban fighters launched to intercept our airplane. But we could always keep ahead of them or away from them. We just turn our knobs, knobs and our delay lines to keep ahead of them. We could listen to them in real time. So it was, uh, we had a lot of fun with it, by the way. But then we were surprised one night when our Cuban translator, he stood up and he said, my God, he said, the, the, fight, the Cuban fighter pilot just told his ground controller, I have the intruding aircraft in sight. <laughs> we're looking at each other, but finally he said, uh, and we, uh, he asked permission to shoot it down. And the ground controller responded, yes, go ahead and shoot it down. Uh, so. We all stood up, and by the, about that time, the, the fighter pilot said, uh, uh, I will start my firing pass now. 
And as soon as he said that, our technician put his switch on the on-off switch, and I nodded, yes, turn it off, and he did. And after a few minutes, or seconds rather, I guess, the ground controller said, you must have got him. He disappeared from my radar <laughs> screen. <laughs> the, uh, but <clears throat> these operations were good news, bad news. We learned, we got the answer we did not want to hear. What we learned was that the, the Soviet radars and their operators were quite good, and they could, in fact, detect and track the A-12 ox car. But since we could determine, we, can, we could vary the amount of power we transmitted, we then knew how small of a target it would take so they could not see the, rate, see the aircraft at all. We took this information, we passed it back through the CIA, back to Lockheed Aircraft, and they now knew what goal they had to reach if they're going to build a true stealth aircraft. And indeed, they did build the, uh, the uh, F-117 stealth fighter. And since these projects continue to this day, they continue to support modern uh, aircraft such as the F-22, the F-35, but mainly they, uh, they, uh, they support the Defense Department's uh, aircraft, Navy, all the services, electronic countermeasures developments. Uh, it turns out that the type of operations we mounted around the world uh, were all unique and one of a kind. Uh, this group that, that we put together, called the Palladium Group, uh, we were called upon by, primarily now by the Department of Defense, rather than just to support the A-12 aircraft. We mounted operations in Vietnam, uh, flying uh, uh, drones over the Soviet SA-2 sites in North Vietnam, so we could actually have our drones shot down but before it was shot down, we could receive the fusing signal from the missile heading toward the aircraft. Then we could get that information radioed back to the C-130 aircraft. Then we could build jammers to jam the fuse signals of missiles attacking it. So uh, these, we were called, it was one of these operations that uh, actually began to count the troops on, uh, on the Ho Chi Minh Trail. It settled the argument between how many troops were infiltrating into the south. But we were called upon uh, around more and more to do things other than support the A-12. But the technology and the collection techniques that came out of this program continue to this day. Uh, one of the, the, the Palladium program became part of NSA's project called uh, Musketeer, which is still in operation today. We basically changed the nature of scientific intelligence collection rather than being the passive techniques that would come from fixed base sites in peripheral aircraft to pick up signals. We would now go after actively whatever information or technical details we needed any way necessary with any type of operation and that today is NSA's Project Musketeer. But, uh, we answered the mail. We didn't always get the answer we wanted. And by the way, we failed a few of our operations as well. They were not all successful, but enough were. And we had a lot of fun doing it. Thank you. Another aspect of the aircraft that helped make it successful were the electronic countermeasures it contained. And though we haven't declassified large amounts of detail about these specific technologies, we can say that there were capabilities to detect uh, the radars from the ground. There were capabilities to detect or to jam the uh, SAM uh, guidance systems or to spoof them. And they were uh, quite effective in helping keep the aircraft safe over the years. As you'll hear, only one of the aircraft uh, flying over Vietnam ever suffered any damage from, uh, from SAMs. And uh, I guess the most accurate estimate for the number of times the SR was shot at was about 1,000 or so uh, over the years, I think. Yeah. Um, a couple hundred. A couple hundred, okay. Uh, and again, none of them ever shot down uh, in the space of uh, 22 years of operational life. <coughs> this turned out to be the essence of the aircraft in many respects and also one of the greatest challenges. Coming up with an engine that could push an aircraft that weighed about 120,000 pounds at a speed faster than a bullet, uh, just like the Superman uh, intro, 
uh, at the edge of space. And how could you do this uh, with conventional engine technology? Well, you couldn't. It had to be created. Uh, modifications from a Navy test program that didn't uh, take off, literally. And so it becomes uh, the purview of Pratt and Whitney to try to develop this engine plant, uh, the J-58. It is the most powerful air-breathing engine ever produced. And to give you a sense of the power we're talking about in this aircraft, vision, if you will, the envision, if you will, the engine room of the Queen Mary ocean liner, uh, one of the biggest ones of the day back in the 1960s cranking out about 150,000 horsepower completely. Put that plus another 10,000 horsepower or so inside one J-58 engine and then do the same with another. That's the power that you have uh, hanging on the wings of the, of the A-12. And likewise with the, uh, with the SR-71, by that time a, a little more powerful, about 34,000 horsepower uh, at its peak. It was a huge challenge. It was the one thing that got uh, the senior managers like DCI John McCone, Director of Science and Technology Bud Whelan and others uh, having uh, hair on fire days because it seemed like it was just never getting up to speed literally uh, in, the, in the time that they were hoping. And it was one of the reasons why the program kind of stretched out and became uh, quite a bit more costly than it was originally contracted for. Dennis Nordquist, who worked at uh, Pratt & Whitney as one of the uh, engine designers uh, down at their facility in Florida, has some great insights into the complexities that uh, were such challenges for uh, the, the engine engineers. Uh, and he will count them for you now for, for a little bit. Dennis? Thank you. I'm going to break it down into uh, three areas. And you're like, there you go. Okay. Push your button. Start over. <laughs> I'm going to break uh, my presentation this morning down into three areas. First, the challenge. I'm going to equate from wanting to get this photographic intelligence down to the engine. Then I'm going to talk about the design that resulted from our engine challenge. And then finally, how did we develop this engine? How did we take that paper design and get it to last long enough so it was safe for guys like Ken to fly? And I was a hot rod enthusiast in high school, and one of my heroes was, in addition to Joe Foss of South Dakota, World War II ace was Henry Ford. And he used to tell his employees, when everything seems to be going against you, remember that the airplane takes off against the wind, not with it. And I always thought about that throughout my career. Only difference was the wind facing us as an engine guy was 2,200 miles per hour. Okay, first of all, the challenge. Uh, it takes a lot more than an engine to fly an airplane. It takes the wings, the airfoils, control, the seat for the pilot, and up to this point, particular time, they could pretty much be developed independent of each other. A guy could develop the engines, and that's exactly what we did at Pratt. We would develop an engine, and somebody would come along and put some wings on it and build an airplane around it. Blackbird, the U-2, was the first one that started to be a systems-oriented to get up there. And then out of nowhere comes this Blackbird requirement, and it kind of took us all aback. And one of the things that I got out of this, the only way that ever could have developed and kept our sending guys in line, it would take a genius like Kelly Johnson because everything we faced was new, and that's especially true in a propulsion system. Up until this point in time, our main criteria was generate thrust. We'd take that airflow coming into an engine and accelerate it out the rear. And the more airflow we could bring in, the faster we could shoot it out with an afterburner, the faster we could go. But yet our environment was up to 30,000 feet, relatively cool, low pressures coming into those. And here all of a sudden now, the challenge we face, 800 degrees Fahrenheit temperatures at the face of our inlet. Pressures going into that engine were extremely high. So you add all of that up at 80,000 feet, 800 degrees to start with, all the fuels we had, we tried those to add it. We couldn't get enough acceleration about the air to keep that plane flying. It would have just fallen out of the sky. But another thing where Kelly Johnson come in and his propulsion design team, it takes more than thrust up there. When you slow that airflow down to get in our engine from Mach 3.2, that 2,200 miles per hour, we could take it at 0.5. If we were higher than that, forget it couldn't make the engine work. So that was the first criteria. 
And would he slow that Mach 3.2 airflow down to our 0.5? That's when the temperatures would build up to 800 degrees, and along with it came tremendous pressure increases that we had to handle at the end. But it's that pressure that pushed the airway, uh, the aircraft forward through the air. It wasn't the engine. The engine, in effect, was one big pump. And basically, it's sucking air through that inlet and exhausted out the, the rear. And there was a fair amount of propulsion power generated in pressure as those nozzles on the rear of the aircraft would expand and allowed some more of that pressure to push the airplane forward a little bit. But that was a very small portion, but it was a very important portion. Okay, our fuels that we had to adapt. We're going to hit that engine at four, 450 degrees because Kelly used it to cool the airframe that Bob had mentioned. And we had to live with it. That's what they gave us. That became our requirement. And there was nothing that existed. If you took, uh, I'll start with gasoline. Sitting here and you drop a match in it, it's going to explode. And the reason it explodes is because at this level, it, gasoline doesn't burn. No fuel burns. It's the vapors that it gives off. It has to vaporize first and then it will burn. So here, package that fuel in the airplane, if you put gasoline or the JP series of fuel up there, it would vaporize at these high temperatures and there's going to go an airplane. So JP7 uh, was developed and to give you an idea, put a can here at sea level, throw a match into it, the match is going to go out because it would not vaporize down here. And that's that same fuel that was leaking all over the airport runways and drop a match. That's why there wasn't a great deal of concern. If it would have been a JP3 or JP4, uh, those leaks probably would have got solved pretty fast. Uh, the other thing now, remember I said we're engine is just a big pump up there. Well, at sea level, we needed a lot of thrust to get that aircraft and its load of fuel and a big heavy camera off the ground. But at cruise, this engine couldn't handle all that airflow that the inlet was providing us. So very early at the uh, our United Technologies Research Lab in Connecticut, a couple guys, Dr. Bob, who was with us earlier in the week, came up with a solution to make that engine bypass the air around the latter stages of the compressor, dump it back into the afterburner where we used it for cooling, and we also used it to cool Lockheed's nozzle on the back, the one that I said expanded out like that. So that become the design. And I, uh, just another little uh, comment. Up till this point in time, all our engines operated about 1,600 degrees Fahrenheit. Remember, they're starting out at 60, 70 degrees inlet temperatures and cruise at 30,000 feet. Maybe it's down to minus 50, minus 60 temperatures. So that fuel provided us plenty, plenty of energy. Up there, the inlet temperature coming into our engine is 800, so we couldn't get by with a 1600. It just wasn't going to hack it. So we chose 2,000 degrees that required completely cool turbines as well. This had never been done. So now that we've got a, uh, a basic design, early, early ones came out of Hartford. It was under a Navy contract. They were looking at going on up there, but they gave up. But we continued the research and the work, and then when the uh, Blackbird requirements came along. It was obvious to Hartford management that they couldn't be testing these engines in a populated area in Connecticut. We knew we were going to have to build a big test chamber to simulate these engines, be able to fly at 80,000 feet. We actually could fly over 100,000 feet. So they came up with the FRDC. It was our Florida Research and Development Center. That was started, broke ground in the late 50s. This program was already underway when it was started from scratch. And from scratch, it was designed as a complete entity, much like the Skunk Works. We had our own manufacturing center. We could manufacture all our engines. We had our own engineering, our own design. And from my standpoint, one of the most fortunate things of all, we were able to leave a lot of the bureaucracy that had built up in Hartford up there. And we had very few people. They were all the senior experienced managers. 
that came down there, but the whole rest of the team was young engineers. I went to work for them. I was 21 years old. Graduate out of college, out of the middle of South Dakota. I'd never been out of the state before in my life. And here I am down there. And just another interesting side point, they were having trouble recruiting engineers in Connecticut. And when they got down to Florida, for every applicant they had up there, they had 30 down there. <laughs> Palm trees, I remember interviewing in the middle of February, and I think it was about minus 30 out. And their brochure had peaches and palm trees. <laughs> so I went home and I told my wife, that's where we're going. She says, I agree. <laughs> then we had to hope we got an offer, and uh, I did. So I was probably down there two months, and I'm right in the middle of things. I mean, they didn't give you time to get up to speed. You had to get up to speed. You were, had to, you were kind of selected as that kind of a person. And there were a lot of us from the Midwest, and growing up, you have to do with very little. Uh, our tools, slide rules has been mentioned. We did have some freaking calculators that would go ka chunk, ka chunk, cha chunk, and you'd pull a lever. Uh, basically, they could do addition and subtraction and multiplication. They couldn't even figure out how to do a square root. We transferred a computer. Well, we didn't transfer it. Uh, our research center in, up in Connecticut had one of the first IBM computers, the 1400. And by the way, that was their IBM's first solid state computer. The one before it was vacuum tube. It was punch cards. And I remember, boy, you really worked your input because typically at the end of the first shift, you'd put in your run to run overnight. And if you'd made a simple little error on that kachunk machine, you had to go back of the list and go in the next day. And bosses didn't like that. And we used that mostly just to calculate the performance of the engine. We did not use it for the design. Sat many days at a draft board, drafting board, pencil. That was it. No computer, CAD CAM, any of that stuff. Okay, test cells. We had eight, first of all, I should mention that uh, this facility was about 25 miles inland out in the middle of the swamps from uh, West Palm Beach, Florida and probably could go in a mile, and it was swamp at that, that time. And the only road out to our facility was a road where the fishermen used to drive out to Lake Okeechobee. It had barely been gravel, so it became the Beeline Highway because it got that name because in the morning all the workers coming out and the end of the day going back. So we all had to commute that 25 days, 25 miles. Uh, anyway, we had eight sea level test cells. One of them to simulate this Mach 3.2, 800-degree inlet, we actually took a J75 and exhausted it into a big barrel and then 800 degrees into the engine. And one of the things that we weren't able to leave behind in Hartford, which is a bureaucracy, was that everybody had to wear white shirts <laughs> and tie. And so we used to have to crawl in that big chamber in front with a white shirt and tie to inspect that engine, and it might be 200 degrees in there. Fortunately, we got the test crew to kind of swear and sweep us in when we'd go in there, we'd take off our tie, but then the code, that was illegal. Uh, also at the same time, uh, since we had this complete facility, our engine assembly area stood right out in the middle of it. We had two, two offices in engineering, one in project which was a normal office, but we spent most of the time out in the middle of this manufacturing floor in a closed area. You had to have a blue badge to get in there. And there was two parts to that. And many people always wondered what was on the other side, on the other wall. Well, we had two engine programs going on. One was with to burn this new fuel, which when we started, we didn't know what this new fuel would be. And the other one was to burn hydrogen. Hydrogen was just starting to come into being, and we in Florida was the first really research center for liquid hydrogen and burning it. And the overall project was called Suntan, to look at the aircraft and the engine. The engine that we had out of this was the 304. And just to give you an idea, there was so much power in that hydrogen engine, the turbines were about that big, driving the compressor, which was bigger than the J-58. Uh, 
probably would have been a much easier engine for us to build and develop, but the problem became packaging that liquid hydrogen on the aircraft. The aircraft grew just too big. And so Kelly and Johnson and his team said, no, you've got to use that other engine, which is the J-58. But we actually built and tested simultaneously with the J-58, that 304 engine. And they're still locked up for whatever reason. But one tremendous thing came out of that. Dick Mulready, who managed that program, took that engine on to develop it into the RL-10 engine, the most successful and first liquid-fueled hydrogen-oxygen engine in the world. And we're still putting it into space. It's still in production. Uh, I think about three weeks ago, out of Vandenberg, it launched another space satellite. So back to the J-58. All the materials had never been used before. We used titanium, and we shared a lot of the experience from uh, Bob Murphy's groups here. But in addition to that, we had alloys like wasp alloy, hast alloy, astro alloy. They had, would all, had, they had all been tested in our United Technologies Research Lab and paper designs, but we had never utilized them in an engine. So that was all new. We had to develop a complete forging facilities, and most of those were up in the Midwest. We did not do that in-house. And we were doing all of this with 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We operated around the clock to build these engines, and now we're ready to start testing them. And typically, so we had an engineering crew. Every week I had worked second shift one day, and about every three weeks I would come in and work third shift continuously for a week. And I was down there about six months out of school, and I'm running one of these engines on this heated inlet test where it's 800 degrees going in. And with the, that picture that you see of the jet engine, that's just ambient 75 degree air going in that. When we would run this engine on this particular test stand, that orange you see was white hot. Move on and up the engine, which you see is dark up there, was the compressor would be red and in between it's orange. And sometimes we'd have four or five of these engines running. So that's why to this day I have a little trouble hearing without a little help. Uh, I'm out there one night, one o'clock in the morning, Simulating this climb to Mach 3.2 with his J75 spitting away in front of it. Whammo, just hit 800 degrees in that big hot engine, 4th of July. We had a lot of 4th of July night shots. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I can't tell you how many engines. We had 13 engine test groups to run on these eight cells. And every one of those guys had blown engines. In addition to those eight sea level, we had five altitude chambers. We could actually go up to about Mach 3.5 and over 100,000 feet. Two of those were full-scale engines, and that was a, was a couple-day affair when we decided to install an engine and get it down there and close the chambers and suck it down to those altitudes and to run an engine. And so hopefully it would not blow the first time, and many times it happened. We'd climb up to Mach 3.2 and blow it. Well, what we'd do is take that engine back to the assembly floor and talk about a close-knit group. Uh, there wasn't much bureaucracy. Uh, there was a turbine group, and for instance, on this engine project I was on, I'd call in the compressor group because that's the part that failed, and we'd sit down right then in our little office out in the middle of this assembly floor, and with a little detective work, we could usually find out what happened and design the new part, take it up to our boss, and it's called an SK. We'd go to a little three-ring notebook, take out a number, put the title on and make that drawing, go up and get it signed off, hand carry it out into the shop to the Bob Murphy's equivalents and have the part made. Take it back down to the floor, install it, and back to test we went. So we had a pretty good turnaround. And for every part number on that engine, ground rule is we'd have 10 designs. We'd have five of those designs on paper that we'd turn into hardware. Might be different materials, configuration, and then we'd test one. And most of the time, early on, those first 10 designs didn't work. So back to the boards, get 10 more designs. So it was a little costly. Finally, we had success. Our goal 
for the A-12 was to get an engine to stay together for 50 hours. We were looking out for Ken. <laughs> and basically it was a simulated flight, so much takeoff time, so much climb, so much at cruise. Well, we thought the testing was going to be partially over, but then started testing again in the airplane and the unstart phenomena happened. And basically when that inlet would unstart, you'll hear more from Ken, airflow to that engine would stop, come close to it. And the fuel control couldn't react over enough, so the first Lockheed test pilots to fly it, the turbine would over temp and blow an engine. And I don't remember if both of them would blow at the same time if they had two inlet unstarts, but we dispatched control engineers out to the field to get control to react a little faster. And combining work with Lockheed, we were able to keep the airplane flying. But the very first engines we flew, experienced unstarts, would blow the engine. And I always thought, because I was back in Hartford listening to that, I said, remembered that different engines blowing up. Unfortunately, uh, we never lost a pilot because of it. And what I really took away from that program, from that hot rod, and I carry this throughout my life, until you spread your wings and fly, you have no idea how far you could fly. We weren't afraid to do something. We just did it. And that was 50 years ago. And the same technology that's used on the F-35 and everything today as far as the engine is concerned are the same alloys, the WASP alloys, the Astro alloys. They've been vastly improved upon. Unfortunately, there's a bureaucracy that is growing up and tagged along with it. And I think that's a tremendous problem in today's world. They don't follow the same rules. Most of the materials and everything follow engineering laws. But bureaucracy doesn't seem to do that. Thanks, Dennis. That, that's obviously a, a running theme you're uh, picking up on, I hope, here, is the uh, streamlined management, uh, walk-around style, uh, levels of, of command, and so forth. Uh, really was a unique situation all across the board. All the subcontractors as well uh, had, had a similar project management style. The um, engine, needless to say, uh, produced uh, an enormous amount of thrust, and that was because of the fuel. But unless you had access to the fuel, uh, it's all pretty useless. And here we want to discuss for just a few minutes the Air Force's indispensable role in supporting the program. You had, at the start of the program, uh, depots established in uh, four different locations that pretty much provided some, uh, some global coverage uh, where the uh, aerial refueling tankers could be uh, filled up and uh, dispatched to the refueling sites. Uh, there was an entire air refueling wing, uh, the 903rd out of Beale, that was dedicated to this program, as well as several hundred members of a component called the 1129 Special Activities Squadron, and of course we know what special means in uh, government nomenclature. They were uh, out at uh, the Nevada test site and at Kadena Air Base where the Black Shield missions were staged from. Uh, we, we can't say enough about the Air Force's role. It simply could not have held together uh, as a project without uh, their support. Now, who's flying this thing? The pilots, an interesting kind of uh, composite biography. Uh, a few different uh, design requirements uh, from the U-2 pilots uh, in order to deal with some of the uh, sociology that developed under that program. And it's an interesting story to uh, hear about how they were recruited, how they were uh, screened, and how they were put on the project. That's pretty well been detailed in the declassified literature. Uh, Ken Collins, who was a, one of the six operational pilots for Black Shield and flew six missions over North Vietnam, and then followed on uh, as a pilot with the SR-71, is here to tell you what life was like uh, inside the cockpit. Uh, ben Rich, the, one of the designers and later head of Skunk Works, described the uh, A-12 is a wild stallion, uh, kind of a thing that you had to, to ride hard and break until you got it under your control. Uh, Ken had that experience firsthand, and he'll talk about that uh, with us for a few minutes. Ken? All the uh, <coughs> pilots, 10 of them initially selected for the Oxcar program, uh, came from the Air Force. Uh, as far as a black shield, there were only six of us uh, that stayed with the program and threw out to fly the Black Shield, which were the North Vietnamese and uh, North Korean missions. Uh, my background is uh, 
Lockheed's finest, the F-80, which was the first Air Force first operational jet. I flew the RF-80s and RF-86s in Korea. Came back out in an RF-84F, uh, transitioned uh, after my tour in Germany into the RF-101. From there, high-speed aircraft, and that was the criteria, one of the main criteria for selecting the crews for the program that we didn't know what we were selected for. Uh, we were asked if we wanted to uh, volunteer for a program, a uh, space program, they called it, and we said, yeah, what are we going to be doing? They said, we can't tell you. So we went through all this physical uh, testing and uh, psychological testing. Uh, we were up here to the area over at 14th Street Bridge, the hotel, you sit there and talk to these people for a while. You go out to lunch and have dinner with them for a while. Uh, you go sit in a room up here to Sheridan for a while and talk to them. They even got your wives and talked to them in contrast to what they had with their CIA U2 program. Those people, all the guys they selected there initially were bachelors. Uh, in converse that they selected the, everyone that had to be married and had to be a stable, alleged stable family. <coughs> Once I got up to the area in uh, late 62, uh, that's the first time I'd seen the airplane first time I'd seen any picture of the airplane. And uh, it's amazing. You imagine walking into a hangar and seeing this black, beautiful thing, because it was amazing. Uh, some of the initial problems we had, of course, the engine was uh, slow in getting together, but once they got it going, it was fine. Uh, we had a trainer with J-75 engines, smaller engines, and we got good experience in that. However, when we started flying uh, the A-12 with both J-58 engines, the engine was just one of the components of the power plant. You had the spike or the inlet that metered and captured the shock wave in the throat of the engine, and it metered the air flow into, as did the tubes around the engine, back into the afterburner. So you actually got about 85 percent of your thrust from the inlet and to the afterburner. If they weren't in synchronization, if they weren't perfectly tuned, you had a hell of a problem. And you'd be out about 2.6, you're hoping to get up to Mach 3, and next thing you'd have an on-start like, say, in your left engine, and it was like hitting a telephone pole. And uh, you had two switches, one, they were both for immediate spike forward, and that would give you symmetrical thrust. If you didn't uh, catch it quick enough, the yaw would be so great, and I said the hit, you'd hit it and it'd just knock the heck out of you. The yaw would be so great, you could compress the stall, the other engine, and blow out the afterburner and the spike. So you had to get them uh, blasted forward very quickly. You could be at 60,000 uh, 60, feet, and if you had an on start, you could end up back down to 20,000 feet before you got everything going again. Usually by that time, you'd with the A-12 and the amount of fuel that we had, you, uh, you'd have to go back to the area and land because you didn't have enough fuel to get back up there and complete your test mission. Uh, very interesting, but that they finally got the, uh, a digital uh, designed control for the spike, the inlet, and uh, for the engine. So that, it started working out pretty good that way. Uh, <coughs> <laughs> One of the uh, uh, problems we had was uh, sometime with uh, the various functions of the airplane, and uh, the, we had fire warning lights, two of them, two engines, and two switches. And uh, they give you a concept of Kelly Johnson's management uh, style. Uh, we could go to our Bill Park, who was the chief test pilot at Lockheed. They'd fly one mission, we'd fly the next day. So we were uh, really intimate with the experimental testing of that airplane and the development. Uh, we said we got a problem with that thing, so he called up Kelly Johnson. Kelly Johnson came to the area and said, okay, you know, he brought his chief engineer with him. He said, I'll tell these dumb pilots how to work that switch and that light. And, but he loved his pilots, he really did. Mm -hmm. And uh, so his chief engineer got up and said, well, you got this toggle switch and you got a light that you push. If you put the toggle switch up and you push the light, the light should go out. He said, no, wait a minute. Kelly said, sit down, you proved their point. <laughs> he said, fix it. <laughs> I think one of the guys says, you know, we have to look out to the back, and the only way you're in a full pressure suit, 
the helmet, you're very limited in, in how you can see and what you can do. Uh, you have, you know, just everything is a, a deserted effort to move around. And uh, we said we need a, like maybe a periscope up here. Well, the first thing the engineer said, and I can't do it, it'll burn off. Because temperature right at the cockpit is 650 degrees. And uh, so we mentioned it to Bill Park, the test pilot, and uh, our friend, and uh, he went back and talked to Kelly. Two months later, we had a periscope that would go up. It was made out of titanium also, but it would go up there. It worked out very nicely, so you could see whether or not you were uh, contrailing or you were leaking any fuel out the back, because at altitude, 80,000 feet, uh, it just blooms out. It's definitely, you know, you could track it visually. The... Uh, the Oxcart missions were uh, very interesting. We'd usually take off from uh, Okinawa, uh, partial fuel, because uh, if you took off with full fuel load, it put a lot of pressure on the gear, and uh, we didn't have 10 landings for, like most aircraft, the landing in the gear. We had 10 takeoffs uh, for changing the tires. But uh, we'd take off, refuel, fly down north of the Philippines, south of Hainan Island, China, and over Haiphong, and we'd descend, after we passed through North Vietnam, we'd descend down to Bangkok, refuel, and air to air refuel, and then turn around and come back up. That was pretty much a standard mission. Uh, the, uh, as I said, uh, it, the perspective of whether or not someone's shooting at you or not is, uh, you know, where you're sitting. If you're in the cockpit, you know, it, it all gets a little more serious. Uh, we felt that we noticed a few. I know Denny Sullivan, uh, the only one, any aircraft, SR-71, and all, all the missions that they flew, and all the things that the uh, A-12 flew, uh, there was only one little piece of shrapnel, not even shrapnel, it was a piece of plumbing on the, one of the SAMs that uh, actually went into the back end, uh, the tail end feathers of the uh, A-12. And that's the only time they ever got any that close to it. What had happened is they'd launched the SAMs, and if they saw they were starting to fail, you know, got up as far as they could, then they'd detonate them and hope that they could, uh, something would hit them anyway. Thanks, Ken. We want to always remember that in addition to the aviation and engineering aspects of this, we're talking about an intelligence collection platform. And we'll spend uh, most of the rest of our time together this morning talking about how the A-12 and the Air Force variant SR-71 were used over the ensuing uh, 22 years after they uh, uh, first would, were used in operations. Recall that by the time the aircraft is declared operational, November 1965, the political feasibility of overflying the Soviet Union is long gone. Uh, Presidents Kennedy and Johnson had never authorized uh, any overflights of the Soviet Union after the power shootdown. So when the aircraft is finally ready to go, what are we going to use it for? There's some discussion inside uh, the U.S. government about possible uh, target areas, but eventually, because of the Vietnam War heating up, the first uh, full-scale troop deployment is in 65, as you recall, this is where it's going to be uh, deployed. So this is the hatching of the mission codenamed Black Shield, uh, deploying the aircraft with a support crew from the 1129th SAS to Kadena Air Base, uh, three aircraft, and uh, three pilots initially and then two at a time rotating in and out of a primary and a backup. The first mission is not flown until May of 1967 and as we said earlier, the Black Shield program, the whole A-12 program, had a very short operational life, really less than a year, uh, late May to early May of the following year. Twenty-six of the missions are flown in the Indochina theater, uh, twenty-four of them up in the Hanoi Haiphong area, two down in the DMZ zone primarily, and then because of the Pueblo incident in January of 68, three are flown in North Korea. And the last mission in Black Shield and the last mission that the A-12 ever flew is over North Korea. I think it's pretty astounding when you think about all of the technical innovation that went into this aircraft in such a short period of time that 27 of the 29 missions were declared fully successful. That is, the aircraft took off and landed with no problems, the cameras all worked, usable photography returned, able to be interpreted, 100% successful. 
One mission was half successful. The camera worked on the first pass, didn't work on the second pass. The, other the only fully unsuccessful mission had nothing to do with technology. It had to do with Mother Nature, unpredicted cloud cover over the target area, rendering the photography returned unanalyzable. Pretty astounding record, I think, given all that went into it. This is a picture of the first mission flown over North Vietnam, 31 May 67. And the, the specs are, are indicated here. Uh, very quick in and out over hostile territory. That, of course, is the, uh, the, the value of the A-12 and the SR-71. You did not have much time over target, but you had all the capability you needed to collect the intelligence uh, necessary. One of the fun things about working on the official history of the program was getting all these dusty boxes of files out of the archives and pawing through things and kind of thinking back how people did their day-to-day -day business back at the time, generating carbon copies of memos, uh, attaching uh, little notes and buck slips to things with pins, uh, rubber bands, literal red tape, things like that. One of the interesting things, though, is coming into these maps. Uh, in a day when everything is done on the screen, here you're talking about the old-fashioned form of cartography, mylar sheets with maps embedded in them, decals and tape and careful calligraphy, little stick-ons, uh, aircraft uh, profiles and silhouettes and such. It's kind of fun to just go back and think about people hunched over boards uh, putting these things together. And there were lots and lots of them. This used to be a, a top secret document and so much of this stuff now is out uh, in the public domain, a lot of it on the CIA's public website. Of course, the A-12 is a photographic platform. You can fly it high and fast. You can take care of all of the other technological uh, bugs, but if it's not taking good pictures, it's pretty much a worthless program. And this was a bit of a challenge. We did have excellent cameras, largely inherited from the uh, U-2 program with some modifications. The Perkin Elmer Type 1 was the one that was used in all of the A-12 missions. But just for backup and for possible other mission uses, two other types of, of cameras were prepared here. And you can see they have as small as an 8-inch resolution. Uh, now, in order to make sense of this, you had to have photo interpreters to look at something like this, taken at 80 to 85,000 feet, uh, traveling at about Mach 3, Mach 3, 1, or 2, and make sense of it. There were mission requirements. The analysts were tasked to look for certain things in certain places at certain times. It's all the photo interpreters art. And to give us some insights into how that was carried out, we have Arthur Beidler, who was uh, a, an agency photo interpreter, forward deployed to Japan. And the importance about being in Japan is this. When the program originally started, Black Shield, you had this as the process. You had the photography taken, brought back to Kadena Air Base, the cameras unloaded, the film flown all the way to Rochester, New York, because it's special Kodak film and only they had the technology to develop it. Then it's sent down to National Photographic Interpretation Center in Washington, where analysts like Art worked on it then a report is fashioned, and then that is cabled out to the field. More often than not, it was timely, but frequently as the war is speeding up, uh, it was in the hands of the people who need it too late. So it's very important to have this facility in Japan where Art worked, and he'll tell you a bit about how he did his photo interpretation work on Project Black Shield. Good morning. The 67 Reconnaissance Technical Squadron at Yokota Air Base um, began in 1941 in Louisiana and went through several transmogrifications before it wound up in Japan. We became familiar and accepted by the CIA to be able to do some of their processing for Far Eastern uh, deployed aircraft. Uh, we gained that trust with the U-2 program in a particular case, uh, we had a weather squadron at Yokota, and they were based, they were based aircraft were based at the Tsugi Naval Air Facility, and their responsibility was weather. Now, we don't know whether that was weather or weather or not. But anyway, we got all of their tape, and we processed that. 
Indonesia came along, there was problems. The CIA wanted, was tasked to find out what was going on in Indonesia. To fly from um, Japan all the way down there and back would have been a little bit taxing, so they deployed a uh, detachment to Clark Air Base. Well, we had to, they asked us to please send a contingent down there to process film. We did, one photo interpreter, uh, photo interpretation officer, Art Andritus, and three lab personnel. And they would get the information from um, the flights coming out of, back from uh, Indonesia, process it, and pass that information on. Well, it seems that the CIA decided to put a new camera on the um, U-2, and it was the B camera. We never heard of it. The people at Clark never heard of it. It showed up at Clark. Well, Art Andritus and the, th and the three lab personnel were able to wrestle that thing, figure out how the camera was configured, process the film, and we got the information. I think that established some confidence with, uh, from the CIA that we could do things. And on uh, back to Yakota, through the process of processing U-2 imagery either from Church Door or several other missions, we continually had our equipment updated. We had a fantastic relationship with Eastman Kodak processing. They um, would send personnel over, explain things, sent new equipment. The NRO was most expeditious in getting us whatever we needed as far as processors. In addition, uh, we had a good cad cadre of uh, PIs. Uh, we were separated. Um, all of the CIA stuff was special. We know what that means. So everything was behind a, um, a special activities office, and only some people had clearances. Um, over time, we kept doing that, and things worked out. Well, we got a hint that something else was coming when one of our lab officers who got back channel communication and was notified that a new film cart would be arriving. A film cart is something that they load the aircraft, the spools from the aircraft onto up against the processors to ensure that um, film was aligned perfectly before it went through the processors, no scratches on the original negative or anything. Well, he talked to the squadron commander, and the squadron commander thought that he was crazy, but um, agreed, well, maybe that was true. So it turned out that um, we started uh, getting Black Shield missions in September of 1957 and continued through the last mission. Our big one was, of course, when the Pueblo was um, captured, and we got the word and our primary job there was find the Pueblo. The film came in, and we had three passes over North Korea. We processed uh, 4,500 feet and uh, 85,000 feet of duplicate negative in 17 hours. The PIs got the film within three hours out of the lab. We had uh, a whole bunch of people looking once on harbor for it. Obviously, that was the place we had heard it was going to be. One young lieutenant, uh, Pete Durnell, decided, well, he's going to take his particular part of film and go to another light table and look someplace else. And he found it in a little bay off of Wonsan Harbor. So we got that message out within three hours. Um, and for that particular mission, the three passes that we had over it, we completed um, updating the North Korea database um, that had not been updated since 1954 um, from the last big missions over there when, during the Korean War. Since then, um, the 67th closed down. Um, the SR-71, of course, took over. Uh, we continued with that, and when the uh, squadron evolved into the 548th at uh, Hawaii, uh, they continued the work there. I, I suppose we have some um, imagery analysts in the audience. Good. <laughs> well, I'm sure you, the way you do things now is a lot different than we had the wet film days, and, and people ask, well, what did it take to be a PI? Well, obviously, you had to go to school. You were selected. You had to have 20-20 vision, corrected. You had to be able to see in stereo. 
And then you had to start looking at things from the top down. How well could you recognize something from above versus from the way we normally see things? So PI school was, um, was about nine weeks, and um, then we had six weeks of radar training because we had to interpret radar film too. Um, this is primarily for the bombers and the fighters, but we had dual assignments. We could go one place or the other. The big things, of course, uh, and I'm sure that uh, they still apply, um, you go by shape and size, logicality of what you're looking at. Is a ball on there? Is it something that shouldn't be there? Is it new? I mean, you really have to know your geographic area uh, so that it's in the back of your mind that you look over an area, um, you can spot if something has changed. The other thing, of course, is orders of battle. We have specialists that specialize only in missiles or ground order of battle or air order of battle missiles, etc. So those things, you just can't go into a situation cold and um, pick up a, a film um, and look at it in stereo and expect to be able to answer all the questions. You have to really know your subject matter, and that's the essence of uh, whatnot. As far as the uh, BX mission over North Korea, f um, the one in which we did a good job, um, Colonel Ray St uh, Roy Stanley, who was at the ca uh, as a captain, was at the 67th and was responsible for our um, setting up our computer systems and whatnot, wrote an excellent book called Asia from Above. And it primarily deals with the 67th, but um, also some of the um, uh, problems you, we encountered with um, processing, with interpretation, and other things of that nature. But um, he did include in his appendix a memo for the Joint Chiefs of Staff it was from the NRO, and um, we were able to update and, and update 108 out of 138 targets over North Korea. And it was from the Department of the Navy saying we have to fly another mission over North Korea. So, and I'm sure that's where uh, <laughs> several of the other missions came from. But I enjoyed the uh, time that I spent at the 67th and uh, was glad to see that uh, the digital age has brought a little bit more ease in your uh, interpretations and whatnot. It's a great job. Thank you. Thanks, sir. It's one of the ironies of the A-12 program that it was canceled even before it was operationally used. But in the uh, Alice in Wonderland world of Washington, uh, something happened that took longer to get the SR-71 going. The A-12 was ready to go, and the war requirements put it back uh, on into operation. But almost as quickly, it is closed down, decommissioned, packed up. Uh, the aircraft on Kadena flown back. Tragically, one of the pilots who was killed in the program died during a checkout flight preparatory to taking an aircraft back to uh, mothballs. Uh, the other pilot was killed in a uh, parachute mishap uh, after he uh, ejected during a test flight. You're probably aware that the Oxcart program was not exclusively about the A-12. There were two other aircraft that came out of it. One was an Air Force uh, fighter interceptor called the YF-12A, which was intended to be scrambled and take out of the air incoming Russian supersonic bombers. Uh, it turns out they never had any, but we had some indications that they did, so we uh, prepared. The Air Force took three of the A-12 airframes, had them modified into the YF-12A. You see photographs of it. It has a big radar dome up front. It uh, shoots uh, nuclear-tipped missiles. Quite different design. A couple of things had to be added to it for uh, aerodynamic stability. Only three were made, and the program never got off the ground, superseded uh, by another system. Far better known, of course, is the SR-71 Blackbird, the aircraft that uh, wound up continuing to fly until 1989 with over 3,500 operational missions. A former pilot of that, Rich Graham, uh, will join us up here at the podium and talk about his experiences with uh, flying the SR-71, the various kinds of missions that it uh, undertook, uh, and uh, the general uh, high degree of accomplishment that came out of that program. You can go over there.
name tag. Is the mic working okay? Yeah. Good. Sounds good. Uh, I don't have a computer working over here, so I'll probably have to refer to the slides. As you can see, we've got the two airplanes now. We've got the SR-71 and the A-12. Uh, we now have an airplane that carries two men in the aircraft. We have a pilot in the front seat. In the back seat of the SR-71 is an Air Force navigator by trade. His duty title is RSO, which stands for Reconnaissance Systems Officer. He handles all the very sophisticated cameras and uh, sensors that we had on the aircraft of the SR-71. So now you've got a two-man airplane. You have Air Force markings. You've got Air Force personnel. American flag patch on your pressure suit, Geneva Convention cards in your wallet, and then the, all the government and the powers to be felt much more comfortable in flying the same missions in a uh, overt manner as opposed to the covert manner of the A-12. Next slide. The uh, operation became uh, uh, completely combat ready in January of 68. And on, on May of, even actually before the, well, the A-12s were still on the island, in March of 68, uh, uh, we flew our very first operational mission by General Jerry O'Malley. He flew the very first operational sortie of the aircraft in North Vietnam. The uh, deployments were permanent from the time we landed over there in 68. Uh, we always kept three airplanes on Okinawa and we always had three crews on station for then for the next uh, 22 years all the time. Uh, we went to Milton Hall in 1976 for the first operational deployment. The very first time we were in, over in the uh, UK of all was the, the Farm Boat Air Show of 1974. And we flew the SR-71 over there by Jim Shelton, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Jim Sullivan in the front seat and he flew from set a record from New York to London in an hour and 56 minutes, landed at Farnborough and put the airplane on international display for the very first time in, uh, at Farnborough. Then the powers of be said, okay, we've got airplanes over at Okinawa covering the Pacific. How about the theater in the European? Uh, and they said, well, we can handle that. We went to Milton Hall. And from about 1976, we started our very first deployment at the Milton Hall, stayed maybe two weeks. Uh, then we'd stay there for two, uh, three weeks, then for two months, and then six weeks. Pretty soon we're doing uh, all the uh, Operation Reforger and all the other exercises they did over in Europe. And by the time of about 1978 or so, 79, we were over there permanently. So we had three crews on Milton Hall, three crews at Okinawa, full time from then on covering the globe. If you just think about those two locations geographically, they're about halfway around the world from each other, and that's what we did. With the in-flight refueling, we covered the entire northern hemisphere gathering intelligence, and we did that quite well. Next slide. Talk about some of the sorties out of California. Home for the SR-71 was Beale Air Force Base, which is still in existence north of Sacramento by about 20 miles. Uh, that's where our families live. That's where we train for the airplane. Uh, training for the SR-71 was nine months long. You had to get 100 hours before you could go operational. The first crews flew their first sorties in Okinawa first before they were sent to Mildenhall. The geographical confines of flying the missions in Europe are a little more difficult than over in the Pacific Theater. So the crews went to the Pacific Theater first before Mildenhall. However, at BO we did fly a few operational sorties, and uh, the first ones of note were the 1973 uh, Yom Kippur War. And we pre-deployed those airplanes up to Griffiths Air Force Base in New York, flew six sorties out of there, and then went down to Seymour Johnson Air Force Base and flew three sorties out of there. Nine sorties. Uh, all of those were some of the longest missions we ever flew in the SR-71. All of them were over 11 hours and 20 minutes in a pressure suit, strapped to an ejection seat, unable to move. So very, very demanding missions. The imagery from those uh, missions in Yom Kippur actually brought the award to a conclusion. A lot of people ask, well, you know, what, what have you really contributed to the United States all during this Cold War era? The Yom Kippur War was probably the biggest uh, demonstration of the capability of the aircraft. It brought back the imagery to both Griffiths and Seymour Johnson that imagery was sent direct to, directly to the president in the White House, and he said, look, guys, both the Israelis and the Arabs in Egypt, they said, you're both lying about where the battle lines are. 
get your lines back and let's get the truce underway. And that's what brought the Yom Kippur War to an end with the photographic evidence we brought back. Back in the late 70s when I was flying it in uh, 78 and 79, uh, El Salvador, Nicaragua, they were getting real testy down there in the Central America, so we overflew those. And we also, for about a four-year period, maybe three or four-year period, we did all the overflights of Cuba. And those are the only operational sorties we basically flew out of uh, Beale Air Force Base. Next slide. First, we'll talk about the sorties out of England, out of RAF Mildenhall. Uh, the one that was sort of our, the Navy loved was going into the Barents Sea. We'd take off out of Mildenhall, refuel off the coast of Norway, get up into the Arctic Circle, come down, image Murmansk on the right-hand side to 180-degree turn, and then come back and image it on the left-hand side and back to Mildenhall or on to another location. Uh, the Navy loved our product up there. Uh, quite often, as many of you may know or don't know, they, uh, they take great pride in knowing where all the combatants are, the Navy does. And every once in a while, that the Greenland, Iceland, UK gap, they would lose track of a combatant. And they would call on us to go up to the Murmansk and see if we could find it. And we did it in most cases we could do that. The next mission we flew, and what I, and these are basic bread and butter missions, was in the Baltic Sea. Now you have to take yourself back in time uh, to the Cold War era, all the Warsaw Pact countries surrounding uh, the Baltic Sea. We would go into the Baltic Sea, make a, a counterclockwise turn, imaging off to the right, all the Warsaw Pact countries, and come back out. The next mission we did was also down in Germany. We'd go into the FRG, and then the FRG would do a clockwise turn, imaging off to the left, all the Warsaw Pact countries. Sometimes you do all three of those missions together. You do a Murmansk, a Baltic, and a Germany and come back. And sometimes you do two or maybe just one, depending what the demands were. And a couple occasions we've been down to, uh, we did the Libya, uh, El Dorado Canyon, the post strike for that, and uh, covered that quite well. The government wanted to get some intelligence of what was going on, and Buzz flew the sortie down to Yemen. And we've also visited the, the Gulf region. Uh, Sorties down there were quite long, would refuel out of Milton Hall at Land's End, get down to the Straits of Gibraltar, into the Mediterranean, get the, uh, the take, and come back out. Fairly long missions on all of them. Uh, never could get over flights from France. Unfortunately, just couldn't do that. A lot of people ask, well, why don't you just overfly the country? Well, that'd be great, and we could do it, and nothing would happen. However, the political ramifications would be tremendous, so we never did that, and we always had to go around to the Straits of Gibraltar. The State Department could never get the overflight clearance. Next slide. Out of Okinawa, uh, we did North Vietnam, flew a few sorties directly over the north. And then after a while, they thought, well, you know, we really need to focus more on the DMZ rather than actually North Korea. So what I call, again, our bread and butter missions routinely for INW, for indications and warning, we would go through the DMZ uh, from northeast to southwest, southwest to northeast, 100 degree turn, and go back and forth through the DMZ, gathering intelligence up to the north. From 80,000 feet, uh, cruising along, our cameras were good, into North Korea for about 100, 125 miles. If you went into a bank of any kind on all your imaging, you could get out to about 135 miles, increase your, your take area by going into a bank. So we did that uh, routinely for uh, well over 20 years in the DMZ. The Navy again called upon us for the Soviet Union's largest fleet headquarters at Vladivostok, and for the same reasons. They would like to know where some of the combatants at, we would go up and image Vladivostok as well. The southern tip of Vladivostok, as many of you may or may not know, uh, at that time had a nuclear testing facility and also a large uh, nuclear subpen up there called Petropavlovsk. And we'd go up to Petro, image it, uh, again, on a, going up on a northbound leg, image it off to the, the left, do a 9270, come back and image it off to the right-hand side and back to Okinawa with the take. And also, we've flown three sorties out of uh, Okinawa all the way down into the Gulf region, refueling out of Diego Garcia. Again, those were 11 hours and 20 minutes in length or longer. So of all those long sorties, you come up with 12, 12 out of the, 9 out of the East Coast and 3 out of Okinawa. Next slide. This sort of summarizes the whole basic uh, 25 years of flying the SR-71. Uh, over 3,500 op sorties, 17,000 total, 53,000 hours plus flown, and of the Mach 3 plus time, 11,000 hours. A lot, a lot of hot time. 
if you add up all the crews that flew the airplane operationally, I, I exclude a lot of people, I exclude the senators, the congressman, the four-star general, the three-star, <laughs> the TV reporter, uh, I exclude the test pilots, everyone that didn't fly it operationally, I have to put out of the equation, we had 86 operational pilots that flew it over those 25 years, which is a fairly exclusive number. Uh, we did that for 25 years and uh, provided the government with some good imagery and uh, keeping uh, the other guys honest. The SR-71's forte, in my mind, always has been and always will be keeping the other guy honest. We did that for many, many years. Thank you very much. Thanks, Richard. I think Rich has made a, a really nice summary of the impact of the program. It's a, a technical marvel, but it's also a, one of the most important intelligence programs that the U.S. government ever undertook. Uh, in the long term, uh, certainly adds up there, I think, with the, with the satellite programs in providing specific kinds of coverage and hot spots, diffusing crises. Uh, technologically, it fully met the mark. Uh, still remains the highest flying piloted jet aircraft, fastest uh, piloted jet aircraft ever, ever made. And as you heard from uh, some of our discussants this morning, uh, the legacies of it live on in a, in a variety of areas that we're dealing with, uh, with today. With that, um, we'll invite your questions, and this includes the uh, folks who are hooked up to us on, uh, on VTC. Fire away, please. Sir. You mentioned that the first public display was in 1974 at Farnborough. International public display. International. What about the, there was a display of the aircraft at uh, the Dayton Air Show, embedded down at Wright Pat, I think that was around 1980 or 81. Was that, when was the first public display in the United States? Well, after we did the Farm Bureau, we started putting the airplane up for air shows just about everywhere. You know, any Air Force base that had an open house and had a, you know, a family day or whatever you want to call it, we would, we would go there. A lot of security around it then. I mean, you know, there was a lot of security, and but we went everywhere. Sir. I wanted to ask Dennis a uh, very technical question. We talked about a number of the materials associated with both the A-12 and the SR-71, and you gave a, a very nice historical uh, background for the J-58 and the program. I wonder if you could talk about the role of ceramics in the, uh, in the blade design or the compressor and uh, other uh, part materials associated with that design, uh, just briefly. Talk about the, the significance of the, the technical uh, capability of ceramics. During the J-58 development, uh, ceramics was another world. I don't think it was ever contemplated very long if it was. It probably was in our research labs. Uh, I guess the closest you could say ceramics come, well, you had some coatings on some of the turbine components that basically were a modification of a ceramic. They were flame sprayed on the, onto the blades and veins. And also the liners in the afterburner, that's where we use some ceramic materials. Uh, the flame holders in the afterburners that held the flame from getting blown out, they were coated with some ceramic material. But it wasn't until quite a few years later that ceramics came into their own as a full blade on some of the smaller units. But one of the things that, I, a lot of things happened by accident. The most important thing to turbine blades was we started to see, and by the way, the turbine blades were coated with a ceramic kind of a material. To see the grain structure, we'd have to have it stripped, decoded, and we started to just notice, boy, the better looking veins that didn't, weren't bowed out of shape so you couldn't use them any longer, we started putting a relationship to the grain structure. And so all of a sudden, there was a big research effort to get a single crystal blade and single crystal veins, and it's how you grow them. But it was by accident that it was happening. You had a question, sir? Yeah. SR-71, why was it retired? 
Yeah, the, the A-12 is retired for cost reasons principally, but also kind of an inside the beltway discussion about what's the proper role of a covert program in an overt military <laughs> conflict. Uh, Rich can speak to the, the SR-71 itself. I was a wing commander in 1987 uh, at Beale. I uh, came out of the Pentagon back to Beale as a wing commander. And, uh, even when I was in the Pentagon before that, and Buzz was there as well, you, you, you could see that every year the money was getting more competitive in SAC. Now remember, we're Strategic Air Command, that's who we belong to, which I've always thought was a bad way to handle the SR. I always thought the SR would be better suited in other intelligence community rather than SAC, because <coughs> here, here is SAC footing the bill for an SR-71, and they're not, they're not getting hardly into the take out of this stuff, maybe a few PSYOP pictures, but basically they were footing the bill for other people, and so we were sort of their stepchild. And even early when we were in the Pentagon, you could see the, the money for the SR programs is getting tighter and tighter and harder to defend it. And come about 1988, 89, uh, there were a lot of whisperings in the hallways of the Pentagon, this thing's not going to last much longer. A lot of politics. Uh, we happened to have the chief of staff of the Air Force at the time that said basically if it doesn't drop bombs or fire missiles, I don't want anything to do with it. And that was one reason. Uh, there were some other reasons why it retired. Uh, it's not because it wasn't capable. The airplane is very, very capable. It, it can pick up three cameras. It's got a radar nose, good down to one foot resolution. It's got tech cameras, which are good down to about five inch resolution. And it's got ELINT that goes 650 miles to the left and 650 nautical miles to the right at 80,000 feet. Like a big vacuum cleaner, this airplane can pick up three, times, three types of intelligence all in one pass. Now, you name me one side of the light that can do that all in one pass, and I don't think it exists. They have, you know, we have great optical, we got great radar, we got ELINT, but not in one pass, and we put good picture together. The airplane was expensive. It wasn't that expensive. The last price tag I saw it was in 1997 when the airplane came back for a very brief period. It came back in 1995, and the price tag on the SR per flying hour was $38,000 a flying hour. Uh, when it retired in 1990, there were three, actually four key senators that listened to very influential, sat on very influential committees in Congress. It was Senator Nunn, Senator Stevens, Senator Glenn, and Senator Byrd. Those four key individuals at that time were very powerful in Congress. And they saw by listening to uh, General Schwarzkopf and many others debrief Desert Storm that the United States lacked a tremendous capability of gathering intelligence anywhere around the globe, day or night, unannounced, and the SR-71 can do that. So they directed in 1995 with congressional language, put the money in there, for the, bring back three SR-71s, bring back the crews, get them combat ready for any contingency that might crop up around the world, and we did that. We reformed at Edwards Air Force case Base because NASA had already picked up some of our airplanes and the infrastructure was already down there, so it made eminent sense to do it at Edwards. Unfortunately, on October 13th of 1997, President Clinton had the line item veto authority, and that was the end of the program for the Air Force. NASA continued to fly theirs until about the year 1999, and ever since then, all the rest of them are in museums. How would add those cables? That was part of the consideration. Because U 2s were flying in with the uh, broadband data links, and they had tested in the SR, but never successfully get a data link off it. And I think that really contributed. And like Rich said, when it came back, they actually worked with the data link, but it didn't go up, it went down. It was kind of a limited data link capability. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. I was with uh, Dead Ford, Mike SRW out of Milton Hall. Uh, one of the advantages that we lost when we did retire the SR-71 was the ability to do synoptic coverage. We were able to overfly uh, and get an image of the entire battlefield at one time, and that's something that uh, we don't have that capability today with any of the systems. The U-2 has the, uh, the optical bar camera. Theoretically, it could do that, except it won't overfly a combat area. That's right. When I got assigned to uh, the debt, I became a key punch operator, because everything had to be, the computers were, you know, key punch. You had to read the cards into a uh, reader, and then that ANS tape would be made, and, dropped into the, into the uh, computer on board the aircraft. Um, it may be interesting to hear what uh, went on autopilot and what it was like to fly the aircraft, uh, monitor the systems, because the cameras were all programmed, you know, via the computer, and the track was also, uh, you know, put into the computer, so 
maybe you'd like to uh, tell us a little about that. Well, it's pretty much like the gentleman said. It, it was all automatic. Uh, you know, the, the RSO in the back seat, that was his primary job to maintain it, monitor all that. But it was all pre-programmed with a big computer in the back of the airplane. We called it, as crew members, we nicknamed it R2-D2 because this thing was smart. And it programmed every sensor, where to look, when to look, and what, what geographical coordinates. And it flew the airplane on course through an astro tracker, triangulated off the stars, had a telescope, navigated very, very accurate. Peter. I, I would add uh, a little counterpoint from the other end of the food chain. I used uh, ESR on two ex sets of related experiments uh, in the uh, 1980s, late the 1980s. I had to pay the Air Force a million dollars a mission to use that aircraft. We needed the money. <laughs> <laughs> When I said $38,000 a planner, I'm talking about the SR. I'm not talking about, now that's adding in all the tanker support and everything else. When you add in a whole package, Peter's right. It's, it's, it's a big, big dollar sign. 85000 That was the figure in 1990. We put the tankers and all those stuff. That was the figure that was being floated around the back. Yeah, but you had a minimum three hour turnaround to all those kind of things. You pay for all those services. Questions? Any more questions from anyone? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, I have a yes, uh, when I was an airman on Okinawa uh, in 1971, I just went in the Air Force, and there was a SR-71, I guess, flying some test missions uh, up and down the coast, and it flew over. I was at Naha Air Base, flew out of Kadena over Naha, turned and went back, and then it went vertical. And it was in the evening, it went vertical with afterburners and just disappeared. Uh, could you talk a little bit about the climb rate uh, for an SR-71? Uh, <laughs> the climb rate of the airplane, it, it, you know, you got a vertical speed indicator and it's pegged the whole time. You know, I think it was 6,000 feet a minute, so it's just pegged. Uh, and the only thing I can really relate to you on that is that we had one mission out of Okinawa, it's called the Rocket Ride. And it was the, one of the few unrefueled missions we had. And internal to the crew members, we had a little game we'd like to play to see who could set the highest time to climb record. And if you had good cold temperature deviations, nice and cold between about, oh, about 48 up to about 63, you had a good chance of setting the record. And the record started when you released brakes, that's when you started the clock, and you stopped the clock when you reached 80,000 feet and Mach 3, you had to have those two parameters met. And as many times as people tried it, the only person that I know that set the record was Jim Sullivan and he did it in 15 and a half minutes. So he still holds the record as far as I know getting up there and cruising. Uh, the gentleman in front had a question. Okay. Yes. Uh, yes, I wondered uh, at operational speed and altitude, uh, Mach 3 plus, 80,000 plus, uh, what, were your, what, was your, what was your radius of curvature when you made one of those 183 turns? I've got one number memorized, and it's out of our book. We have book, all you do is look up your bank angle and your true airspeed, and that gives you your radius of turn. And the one that I've memorized for audiences is 32 degree bank turn at Mach 3. When you go into that bank, your radius of turn is 65 nautical miles. If you do 180, that becomes a diameter of 130 miles. That um, wide turning radius was one reason why in 1964, President Johnson decided to surface the program because when the aircraft were running their tests out in Nevada, you simply, obviously because of that capability, keep it in secure area all the time. So it was overflying places where people were living. Airline pilots were seeing these things doing strange things. Uh, there were sonic booms, windows shattering, constant complaints uh, to, the, to the local authorities. And a lot of concern that if a crash occurred, it would happen under circumstances that uh, the program managers couldn't control. So Johnson uh, surfaced the program, not with the A-12, which remained secret, but with the YF-12A, which at Kelly's suggestion was named the A-11. And this is the one that was uh, announced as being at, uh, at Edwards Air Force Base. But uh, as I'm told the story, there weren't any there when he made the announcement. And so the call came out uh, very quickly to get some down there for, uh, for photo opportunities. And one arrived, and uh, again, so the story goes, 
it was so hot from the, uh, from the, the quick flight that when it moved into the hangar in order to, to park itself, it was so radiant that it set off the fire uh, extinguisher system oh, and, yes. as Kelly said, got a free car wash uh, just for the president. That's a true story, by the way. <laughs> well, our standard A-12 test mission we were in flying out of Nevada is we'd go north, and it was about an hour and a half mission, and we didn't have any problems in the U.S., but the Canadians got mad at us because all the sonic booms were going when we made the 80-degree, 180-degree turn back, went into Canada. And they broke the record coming back from England to L.A., nonstop, three hours, and I can't remember the minutes. Uh, they blew the windows out of Zadiga Gabor's big bay window, and she had invited Buck Adams and his RSO to dinner. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes, sir, way in the back. Uh, every documentary I've seen uh, this is the cruising speed of 3.2 miles plus. Is there a sprinting speed that you quantify with the plus goal? Well, the real yeah, what, what we have uh, documented, uh, as opposed to uh, pilot lore about the, the aircraft speeds, uh, we have it uh, from the A-12 declassification material as 3.29 at 90,000 feet from a, from a single aircraft. Uh, we know that other people did other things at uh, other times. Uh, I, I don't know that any of those are documented. The, uh, the SR's documented speed record was the, um, I guess, the, the cross-country flight. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, lots and lots of them, but I, I guess the, the peak one was the, uh, and it depends on the definition of the, of the record, you know, closed course, straight on and all of that. Um, I'll yep. give you a little uh, deal how we knew what happened. Uh, if you look at the airplane, there's fillets coming from the fuselage over the wing, and after a few of these Mach 3 flights, all the gap fuel tanks on the SR went all the way out to the engine, the beam at the engine was 800 degrees, so those tank tanks it was always burnt black. But what was under the fillets wasn't. Well, we knew a pilot had put his hand over the airspeed indicator when the tanks under the fillets were burnt black. So the deal was he's going into North Vietnam, hand over the whatever the hell he can get out of it. <laughs> I'll just tell you from an Air Force standpoint, uh, we were allowed, to, we normally cruise at 3.0, all the cameras are programmed for those speeds. So you don't want to be faster or slower than because they're, they're counting on you being on track on speed to get the imagery. Uh, we were allowed to go to 3.1, to get to 3.2 without any problem. We were allowed to accelerate to 3.3 under one scenario only, and that's called our tactical limits. We were allowed to go to 3.3 if in fact we felt that by accelerating to 3.3, we'd get out of harm's way. So if you ever felt yourself in harm's way, we could go to 3.3, .3, and that's all. The actual speed limit on the airplane is a CIT, a compressor inlet temperature, yeah. 427 degrees Celsius. I think the airframe is capable much faster, but the engines, 427 degrees Celsius, we were redlining the cockpit for that, that's as fast as you were allowed to go. Yes, Bob, uh, uh, test pilot. Bob Gilman. I asked Bob as a test Lockheed test pilot. I said, Bob, what's the fastest you've ever flown it as a test pilot? He said, Rich, I've been up to 3.4, and that's it. So that's what I tell people. On the Roadrunners International website on the Internet, uh, I believe it's Roadrunners International, <coughs> there's a declassified copy of the SR-71 flight manual. It's a very, very large file. Parts of it are redacted, but it, there are some limits quoted in there that are pretty high. Well, the same limits I'm talking about. That's, that's where I get all my data is right from the flight manual. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. As part of the satellite development program, the Corona and Solomon satellites, they went to Kelly Johnson and asked him could his special Skunk Works people build this particular satellite, and it dealt with the uh, Gina st top stage of the rocket. And he looked at it, and he said, it looks like a stovepipe. 
<laughs> it's got no wings. There's nothing to it. I'll have one of my guys build it for you. <laughs> I want to one. Oh, we got at the tenth anniversary. Kelly got a question. Tenth uh, anniversary, of the first flight. He said, uh, "How long are these airplanes good for?" Kelly said, "They're good forever. They get heat treated every time they fly." <laughs> True. Any other questions? And nobody's popped up on the DTC, so uh, thank you very much for coming. Uh, you found it uh, an enjoyable morning. We certainly have and appreciate your attendance.